Wisconsinized coverage of Campaign 2014 is being brought to you by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. For over 90 years, a valued voice supporting Wisconsin hospitals in communities like yours. Wisconsin Eye coverage of the 2014 elections continues. We're interviewing Rob Zerbin. He's a Democrat from Kenosha, and he's running in the 1st Congressional District. Rob, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thank Just you very a much. footnote, Wisconsin Eye thanks the Wisconsin Hospital Association for helping make these interviews possible. Well, I say welcome back because you ran last time? Yep. Correct me here. Yep, ran in 2012. Right. Um, and your personal story, you uh, I think you said you were raised in some hard circumstances, became that's a correct. successful businessman, sold your business. You have a great memory. Um, that's, that's right. Well, thank you very much. And then um, ran once. What did you learn? Um, why are you coming back against uh, Congressman Ryan? Well, you have to survive a primary first, but just tell me about the well, political uh, dynamics, sir. Well, thank you. I, I think, uh, you know, with the, the results we had in the 2012 election cycle, you know, we had such a great, um, great result. You know, getting Paul Ryan below 55% for the first time in his career, especially after he won with over 68% in 2010, you know, winning his hometown, his home county, even his home voting ward. These are great results for a first time candidate taking on somebody who ended up being the VP nominee. So I, I felt that we could actually build on those results and, and you know, uh, possibly take it this time. Well, he has a decision to make whether to run for president. Mm -hmm. That's got very little to do, or does it have a lot to do with how you're going to run this campaign, Rob? No, you know, I'm going to continue what I've always done. I'm going to continue to meet with the people of the 1st Congressional District, listen to what it is they have to say, because in the end, it's it's their choice and who they want to have represent them. And so I, I look forward to continuing that kind of that kind of work and advocacy. You know, I'm meeting with the uh, firefighters and going into the homeless shelters and talking to people and, and seeing what's important to them. Well, I do have some questions on issues, but sure. before we get there, let's go down what you told the convention, your platform for progress. First, get money out of politics, amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United? Absolutely. Is that possible? Um, I, I'd like to think so. I think that we need to undo the damage that this unlimited amount of money that's coming into our political process is having on our democracy. Uh, it's disenfranchising millions of people. And so we need to do everything possible to uh, take back our democracy and make sure that everybody's voice is being heard and not being drowned out by uh, millions and millions of dollars. Is that a bigger issue? Does that issue resonate more in 2014 than it did in 2012 in light of the recent Supreme Court ruling removing the total limits? It's going to be interesting to see. You know, I think a big surprise was the loss of uh, Eric Cantor losing his primary recently, yes. spending about five million dollars, and uh, so forty-two you know, to one. I, spent that challenge. I know that's Excuse incredible. No, that's okay. Uh, it's great debate. So I think that that's going to be an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, in the end, it's actually the voters that get to decide these elections, not the special interests who fund you know uh, campaigns to the tune of millions of dollars. So that's exciting for us. You know, I'm excited because we have a great candidate candidate and Mary Burke on the ballot and uh, midterm elections are notoriously harder for Democrats and I think that her candidacy can actually drive the kind of turnout we need so that's a uh, I think um, I'm, I'm hopeful very hopeful that mid to this particular midterm might show that money is not the end-all be-all in American politics but I fully support a, a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics and you also support my notes from the uh, convention show public financing of campaigns mm hmm and that would be no spending by any third party groups. Correct, I, I do fully support that. Um, then you want to invest more in uh, our infrastructure, what do you mean? Bridges, highways, mass transit? All of it. You know, we need to, we is need to make a jobs issue or what? Both. You know, this is a, a jobs issue, putting people back to work, making sure we can get our economy rolling again. And I think that the government has a legitimate responsibility in doing that. And we have a, a responsibility to pass on an America that is well equipped and prepared uh, for commerce in the next century and pass this on to future generations because it's our responsibility to take care of what we've been given and make sure that we're passing on an America that can compete in a global economy. And part of what you said then uh, also raise the minimum wage. How high should it be? You know, that's a subject to debate. It's, um, you know, I've talked to economists who believe that $15 an hour is okay. I've talked to economists who believe that that's, that gets into a little bit of a gray area. Um, but I think the general consensus is we're very safe at 10 10 an hour. Um, I, would, I would support $15 an hour, uh, but I'm not sure we can get that done. And so it's a matter of what's possible, too. 
and protect the safety net. And you use the phrase Medicare for all. Is that you calling for a single payer system, sir? Medicare is a single payer system. And so you um, want that for, for, the, for everybody? I do. I believe that this is something we eventually need to get to. I, I fully support the Affordable Care Act and the great accomplishments we've made and, and the milestones we've hit with it. You know, covering additional millions more people have now coverage. Uh, kids get to stay on their parents' programs until their uh, their insurance plans until they're age 26. We've removed caps on on uh, plans. We've you know eliminated pre-existing conditions. These are great first steps, but we need to get to a point where we settle this once and for all. This is holding us back uh, internationally. Um, it puts us at a competitive disadvantages with other countries who are producing goods who have already figured this out. We pay the greatest amount of our GDP into healthcare of any industrialized nation. So I, we need to get to a point where we have Medicare for all, where everybody has coverage from cradle to grave. Um, you also told the Democrats, final point, health insurers bankrupt citizens. Bankrupt citizens? Yeah, health, it is health bankruptcies, the number one reason for uh, bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies in the United States is unpaid medical bills. Okay. And this is care into it's not, you know, Medicare is just a delivery program for administering health care. The driver, the driver of the cost of that program is actually uh, unregulated health insurance or health industry uh, providers who are you know, taking advantage of the system. And that's why we need to really make sure that we're working on getting rid of the waste, fraud, and abuse from the program. You must have read my notes because my next question is both Medicare and Social Security on track to go bankrupt, although a few years out. Uh, how would you fix that? Well, you know, um, there are ways that we can fix this. Some of them, actually, some of the fixes are quite simple. You know, my position with fixing Social Security is we simply need to scrap the cap on payments into the uh, Social Security system. I don't believe that there's any justification for somebody who's earning hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars to pay in at a lower rate than somebody who's earning forty thousand dollars. Why should that person earning forty thousand dollars be taxed higher than somebody who's making a lot more money? So I think everybody needs to pay in uh, equally in his or her fair share to make sure that Social Security is, sec is secure for future generations. And again with Medicare, mm -hmm. uh, rooting out the waste, fraud and abuse and, and making sure that we're regulating and controlling the costs that are driving that program into insolvency. Immigration, a uh, huge issue. It played a role in Eric Kanter's defeat yesterday. Yep. If there, if someone is here illegally, should they um, have a path to citizenship? Sure. sure. Absolutely. They well, should. What should be, they have to do? They should be given a meaningful path to citizenship. That one that is not um, blocked with uh, unachievable, you know, hurdles they can't surmount. Uh, and, you know, I would have supported the Senate bill had I been in Congress and had that version come to the House floor. I would have voted for the Senate version of the bill. I didn't agree with everything that was in it. Mm -hmm. I thought some of those uh, provisions were a little bit too onerous, but in the end, that's what bipartisan agreements are all about. You give up some of the things you don't agree with or you, you agree to some of the things you wouldn't normally support and, and hopefully get some of the things that you really want in there uh, as part of, the, part of the bill. So I think... Um, you, you've got to have an ability to bring these people out of the shadows and incorporate them into society so that they can have a, a meaningful uh, life and existence here in the States and be contributing members of our society. What about the thousands of children from Honduras and Guatemala that are showing up and crossing the border? They're as young as six. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, one public radio report that one six-year-old was caring for her four-year-old sister. No parents. Um, would you... Uh, how would you, how would you resolve that in terms of the whole larger issue of immigration? Many of, many of our ancestors all came here to make a better life for themselves, and that's what these people want too, and they've got to be given a chance to, to be able to do that. So uh, we need to make sure that we're providing for them uh, some security, some safety. Uh, they want to make a better life for themselves. America is a land of opportunity, and it still is. It's a beacon, beacon of hope for so many people, and we've got to, we've got to help them make their way. We've got to give them a path to become citizens. That this is where they want to choose to live and be productive members of our society. Um, recently, um, same-sex marriage. Judge Crabb's ruling holding that our constitutional provision prohibiting same-sex marriage mm -hmm. uh, is unconstitutional. Your response to that? I've always been in support of marriage equality from. From when I first started getting active um, in 2008 here in Wisconsin, um, you know, I started out with the environment was the reason that I got active in my community. And uh, it just seems that uh, people shouldn't be judged by the person that they choose to love. And it's not the government's responsibility or role to determine who can and who cannot marry and how they can and cannot show that love for one another. And I've been very clear about this from day one when I was in the congressional race that I've always supported marriage equality. 
Foreign policy is in the news a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, what lessons about fighting international terrorism and limitations of U.S. foreign policy has the nation learned from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, I, Iraq was a mistake and we never should have been there. And there are limits to what our policy can do and how far we can reach. But we must use every tool at our disposal to make sure that we are protecting our American citizens abroad and here at home. So, but there are limits to that and we need to have good strong partners in various regions uh, of the world where we need to work to combat terrorism. So I think we probably learned that you need to be more careful with the allocation of resources and make sure that you have good strong partners who are willing to, to help you in those regions. What's the criteria, what's the next time the United States should put the, the old phrase boots on the ground in a foreign country? What, 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 what would justify that? You know, that's a, that's a great question, and I think that it has to be judged on a case-by-case uh, -case basis and, and what it means to American security and the security of Americans abroad and that of our allies. Um, so I, I think you have to take it, uh, you know, one step at a time on a case-by-case -case basis and, and look at them individually on their merits. Was the exchange of five uh, Taliban terrorists for one held U.S. soldier a, a fair deal? Absolutely. We, we must do everything possible we can do to bring all of our service men and women home. Um, you, do you have a position on the Keystone proposed I am absolutely pipeline? opposed to it. Why? I, I, my activism is rooted in the environment and I don't believe it's good for our country and our environment. You also told the um, uh, state convention climate change is reality. Uh -huh. um, is that because you believe many politicians in Washington deny its existence? I do believe they deny its existence, and I think that America has an obligation to lead the world in, in creating and developing green technologies, green energy, and renewable, uh, and a new green economy. Um, we can't afford to let other countries lead in this area. And to be a leader, you need to, to show, some, show some leadership and, and start these, um, um, these industries and these processes and uh, I think there are other countries that are, are starting to try and do that I and mean, we need to lead because I believe if we create energy independence this is economic security and uh, we, we all want economic security. Um, you also said another point stronger gun background checks. Mm -hmm. um, what law would you change and how would you change it sir? Well I would fully support universal uh, background checks and I think with the quicker we can implement that and the registration of felons on a state-by-state -state basis becoming mandatory uh, to make sure that we're doing everything possible that we can keep guns out of the hands of criminals. Um, another thing you got into a state issue you said in the failed vouchers experiments. Why mm -hmm. have they failed sir? Well anytime that you're taking 1.6 billion dollars out of the education system as Governor Walker has done with his budgets and then you propose an expansion of voucher programs which will further exasperate the resources that are available to public schools, that's, that's taking resources away from kids and in an environment where they may not have the choice as they like to call these as a choice. Um, and I don't believe that that's the right way to go. I think that we need to make sure that every child is treated equally and fairly when it comes to being able to get an education. Um, uh, I know you have a primary, but you did talk about uh, Governor Ryan in your convention speech. I'm sorry, Congressman <laughs> Ryan, excuse me. Um, basically blamed the poor for being poor. Can you explain that? Yeah, he um, has made some statements recently, you know, his now infamous comments about the inner city male. And then he's talked about how he feels that traditional marriage and friendship we could be the um, solution to poverty in our nation, along with cutting programs that people depend upon, like heating assistance and housing assistance, mm -hmm. SNAP and WIC. Mm -hmm. and, and I took some of these attacks kind of personally because I was a recipient of these programs as a child. I got free lunch and milk at school. My mom uh, got government cheese to help feed us when we were children, which that program was rolled into WIC. And I intimately understand why these programs are so important to help break that cycle of poverty. Because if government hadn't been a partner in helping me get an education, helping feed me, I would have never gone on to become a successful entrepreneur that I was and provide excellent wages and benefits for almost 50 people. And that's what's so important about these programs. And, and you know, Paul Ryan probably has never taken advantage of these programs, except Social Security, I think, when his father passed away, that he was able to save it for college. Well, that's great, but most of the people I know would have had to use that money to survive. Uh, so I, I hate to see anybody who's in a position 
of writing budgets, going after these programs that help so many people. Um, what would be the impact? Uh, as chair of the House Budget Committee, he put forth a budget. Mm -hmm. What would be the impact on this nation if it became law? I think that the consensus is in that it would be disastrous. How, in, in, in what areas, sir? Well, um, with respect to, I mean, the uh, the impacts that uh, the vouchers for Medicare, things like that. Uh, yeah, excuse changing. me, I don't want to get yeah, no, ideas. No, 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 you ideas. You're, you're the candidate, you know, not me. There, I, I was trying to go back to a, a memo that I saw regarding how many people would be affected by the budget cuts that he had implemented here in the state of Wisconsin, how many people would lose assistance for heating and assistance for um, SNAP, and, and it's, it's quite drastic. Um, and I think most of the people had their voice heard in 2012 when they rejected the, the Romney-Ryan ticket and the Ryan budget. And you know, I think once the national spotlight had been shown upon his budget and the drastic draconian cuts that are in it, that's why it was so resoundingly rejected. Congress has not been able to agree on uh, extending uh, unemployment benefits. Bad thing? It is because in a time when you're in a fragile um, economic recovery from the greatest recession we've seen since the Great Depression, you need more money in the, the system to be able to get the economic engine rolling again. Mm -hmm. And cutting the uh, unemployment, long-term unemployment benefits, not extending those benefits, um, I think has probably hampered our recovery and, and our ability to get our fiscal house in order. So I think it was, it was a unfortunate that that happened. Um, I want to give you a chance to highlight any other major issues that I haven't asked about, sir. Hmm. Anything? Great question. No, I just you know, okay. just like to highlight the great success we had in 2012 and and continue to build upon that success. Uh, how are you running differently 2014 than 2012? Well, we we're faced with a different set of challenges in 2014 as opposed to 2012. You know, in 2012 I was relatively unknown, just a county board supervisor from Kenosha. And uh, so the challenge was getting my name out there, letting people know what it was that I stood for. And uh, you know, we can see how, how the great success we had. And um, this time we've done a vote, uh, vote total calculation, and we need actually 20,000 votes less than we received in 2012. I think to you win told the convention you need 138,000. That's correct. Okay, that's our win number. And in 2012, 158. What, what's the relationship there? Well, there's reduced turnout in the midterm yes. elections, and uh, that's why I was talking about being excited about having Mary Burke in this historic gubernatorial candidacy. Uh, being the first female gubernatorial candidate from a major party, and I think that that actually can drive the kind of turnout we need to get those, those uh, to that number of 138,000. 138 wins it, huh? Yep. Uh, Want to give you a chance to highlight differences between you and your primary opponent on August 12th, sir? Well, you know, uh, like I said, you know, I know how to run a successful campaign. Uh, I've been here uh, working in in the district on a daily basis. Uh, you know. Reading rooms and at uh, House of Mercy in Janesville for the next homeless family. I've been meeting with the firefighters in the stations in Kenosha, talking to them, getting into the community, uh, and and really understanding what it is that they're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, you know, having been a small business owner, somebody who employed almost 50 people, I intimately understand the challenges that small business owners face, and I think that's great experience. Very good. Rob Zerbin of Kenosha is a Democrat running in the 1st Congressional District. Mr. Zerbin, thanks for coming back to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks for having me. Thank you.